So I'm Michael Zandi, I'm a consultant neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London, in Queen's Square, and honorary associate professor at UCL, Queen's Square Institute of Neurology. NMDA receptor encephalitis is the most common form of autoimmune encephalitis. It's an illness that can affect children to the very elderly and is characterized by antibodies that bind to the N-methyl deaspartate receptor. So the illness is caused by antibodies that bind to the NMDA receptor in the brain. The cause of that can be like many other autoimmune illnesses like lupus or thyroid disease where perhaps genetically susceptible people who may have been exposed to certain viruses can then develop this condition. Some people have the illness triggered by a tumour within their body, most commonly an ovarian teratoma, though overall that's quite rare. And others, particularly children, can have the illness triggered by a viral infection even in the brain, for example the herpes encephalitis. Rarely we're now seeing new drugs that are being used for cancer or even in multiple sclerosis that can trigger this as an immune response. The interesting nature of NMDA receptor encephalitis is that it doesn't respect the textbooks and patients can present to psychiatrists first or to neurologists or in the emergency department. So there can be a range of symptoms reflecting how the antibody is causing different problems within different parts of the brain. So often initially there may be a headache and fever, but quite soon there can be symptoms of disorientation and oftentimes symptoms that are really hard to distinguish from other mental health uh, disorders, for example, first episode psychosis. So patients and their family can recognize disorganized thinking, maybe hallucinations, hearing voices, paranoid thoughts. Now, these symptoms can get worse over a few days or weeks, and in some people then there can be the onset of seizures, which may often be the first time it's clear that there's some form of encephalitis or uh, uh, inflammation in the brain. Other patients can, after their seizures, develop unusual movements and be on the intensive care unit for a very long period of time while the diagnosis is reached and even during treatment. The diagnosis of NMDA receptor encephalitis remains a clinical one and it's still challenging and much research now is focused on how to make the diagnosis earlier. So we make the diagnosis, like in many other brain diseases, on the story from the patient and their family, the clinical history that is, the examination findings, and then we support the diagnosis with tests. We, most patients will have an MRI scan of the brain, or at least very initially a CT scan of the brain, to rule out other diseases that can look exactly the same, for example tumours, herpes encephalitis and strokes of some type. The most useful test, as in viral encephalitis, is a spinal fluid examination, a CSF or lumbar puncture. And this is important to rule out again infection and other illnesses, cancers, but also to look for autoantibodies. And we do blood tests to look for the NMDA receptor antibody, but we also encourage people to look for the antibody in the spinal fluid too. A brainwave test, an EEG, is also very useful in making the diagnosis. Once making the diagnosis, the focus is on supporting the patient through whatever illness they're going through and at the same time giving disease-specific treatments to treat the encephalitis. So if this patient has psychiatric symptoms or psychosis, we use antipsychotic drugs. Seizures, we will use epileptic drugs. And if the person in needs intensive care support, then that's very important. Often while the diagnosis is being made, we may have a patient who's quite ill, and needs to have intensive nursing and constant monitoring hospital. To treat the encephalitis, once we have excluded other diseases and we're confident this is NMDA receptor encephalitis, we use a combination of drugs. Most people will have steroids either through a drip, intravenous methylprednisolone, followed by tablet steroids, prednisolone, in the initial stages. This is usually not enough and either a dialysis type procedure to try to wash out the harmful antibodies and this is plasma exchange 
is used and that can take uh, a few days or on a ward. And if this is not available or for other reasons, if we don't think it's safe to give to somebody, we will use intravenous immunoglobulin, which is a blood product from healthy donors, which has been screened for infections. And that's given as a drip uh, over two to five days to try to reduce the inflammation in the brain. Now those treatments can take a week or two to start to show an effect of working. And we now know at the same time we need to keep looking for triggers of the illness, including small tumours in young women, look at the ovaries for example. But if a person isn't responding well to the first line therapies that I've described within a couple of weeks or so, we then want to move on quickly to more advanced treatments. These include cyclophosphamide, which is a chemotherapy agent really to try to reduce inflammation in the brain, or rituximab, which is a monoclonal antibody, a magic bullet, which is designed to target the B cells, which are very important in what is the run-up to inflammation in the brain. They go on to produce antibody-producing cells that cause the NMDA receptor antibodies to be present in the blood and then cross into the spinal fluid, but the B cells themselves can cause inflammation. So we give people rituximab, and then we want to have a period of time before adding new immune therapies to see if that works. Rarely in the person who's still on the intensive care unit or is quite sick, we've been using some experimental treatments used in other diseases where antibodies are causing problems. So the outcomes of NMDA receptor encephalitis are quite variable, but generally we feel they're better than they used to be. It's a serious illness, so particularly the person in the intensive care unit for a long period of time or even early on can die from the illness still. And then a group of patients will have significant memory problems and mood problems that can last quite a long time. But a proportion of people can return back to work or to their studies as if nothing had happened. And in many ways, it's a better type of encephalitis to have than herpes encephalitis because there is, in most cases, no permanent damage or destruction to the brain. Although we are doing research to try to see what kind of damage is being done that a conventional MRI scan, for example, can't pick up. Patients are left with epilepsy. They may have still psychiatric type symptoms, paranoid thoughts, and they can often have thinking problems that can last a long time. And also the complications that may have arisen from their stay, for example, in a long intensive care unit where infections or thrombosis uh, due to treatments or just being uh, immobile for a prolonged period of time, despite the best possible care and attempts to prevent these complications can still occur. An individual who's had this form of encephalitis then has to deal with the stigma associated with any form of brain illness. And this is still an under-recognized illness, so most people haven't heard of it. And they also have to deal in some patients with epilepsy, with all of the stigma and uncertainty and concern that living with epilepsy can have. And then just trying to get back to work and trying to, to get back to normal function can take a very long time. So this is an illness that can have a significant financial impact and an impact on families.